Um, so the story of Comanche and his captain, for me, it was really a, a childhood story and a very simple one. Um, my father told me at one point that there was this horse that had survived a, a terrible battle. Um, I think I was about eight years old and we had gone to the movies. He and I were movie buffs. We spent our weekends in the movies and um, I no, doubt, no doubt it was a Western and you know, some horses got hurt and some horses got killed. And I, I was eight years old. I didn't know about Hollywood. I didn't know about fake blood. I didn't know about tripwire. So, so I took it to heart and I was, and I was upset. And it was the time for him to drop in this little story. My father by, by profession was an engineer, but I always think of him as the consummate educator because he knew when to just add a little something to whatever was going on. And so for me, it was this very simple story of this, this survivor horse. And that was it, that was it. It lodged in the back of my brain and, and it, uh, you know, it kind of simmered there for many years, many years, until a few years ago when I was starting to think about another topic. Um, they called her reckless was doing well and so you know yes i thought hmm, i wonder if i can if i can do this again and don't ask me why but comanche kind of bubbled to the surface and then i started to think about him and then what really really um intrigued me was that there is always this connection right you know you don't have a great horse without a great rider in some respects and i would say vice versa um so it's that it's that combination that's symbiosis and there are some wonderful examples i mean oh gosh let's go way back in history bucephalus who wrote him well alexander the great from age 13 until i think age 37 when the horse died um um, in the 1800s, there was a, a war mayor by the name of Marengo, and her rider was Napoleon. And in the Civil War, I mean, we have some wonderful examples, right? Traveler, Traveler, Traveler was the horse of General Robert E. Lee, who, according to many people on both sides, was the greatest of the militarists in the Civil War. Uh, Cincinnati, written by Grant, who was then general before he became president. And hey, we've got a, we've got a homebred here, a horse that was born and bred in Summers, about what, about an hour north of where the library is. And he was the mount of General Stonewall Jackson. And uh, all right, one more, one more. Who rode Trigger? Anybody? Well, yes, Roy, Roy Rogers rode trigger. So, so my point being that you've got this, you've got this combo going. And as I and as I re really dug, dug into Comanche's story, I found that yeah, I mean here you had this tough American Mustang, and his rider was an Irish soldier of fortune, a Captain Miles Kehoe. Um, he was born in Ireland in 1840, uh, the youngest of 12, of five sons and, and 12 children totally, and he may well have been the youngest child, we're not quite sure of that. Um, born in County Carlow in the southeast port, part of Ireland, a beautiful part of the country. The country itself gorgeous, but this a particularly lovely part. Um, in the town of Leyland Bridge, which was one of the river towns on the River Barrow. The family was Irish Catholic. And in those years, to be Irish Catholic was not a great combination. Um, it didn't work for a lot of people. Ireland in those days, and for many years thereafter, was a colony of Great Britain. And Great Britain was resolutely the defender of the Anglican Church of England. And when they wanted to be, they could be very, very anti-Catholic. Um, but it seems to have worked for the Keogh family. They were they were established in the community. They'd been there a long time, and uh, it seemed like you know life was life was good for them. Um, in 1845, Miles at that point was five years old. That terrible famine struck, called the Great Famine, called the Potato Famine, um, and it obliterated the potato crop in Ireland for the next four years. I mean, it was the devastation was was hideous. I mean, this was a poor country to begin with, and over that time, the years of the famine itself, and for years thereafter, it, it, um, it reduced uh, the, the smallish population, which had been about 8 million, it reduced it by 25%. Half of that to, to disease and death, the other half getting out of Ireland any way they could. Um, the Keogh family survived economically. Uh, John Keogh, the head of the family, I think was a smart dude because the main crop on their farm, a, a, a moderate spread of almost 20 acres, the main crop was barley. And barley was grown throughout 
barley was harvested and bundled and put on the flat bags on the barges and sent down the river barrow to the breweries. A pint of ale was always a good thing, no matter what the times. So, so economically they survived. Uh, emotionally, um, what can you think? I mean, to see your countrymen so so destroyed, even as you're doing okay, must have been must have been terrible. And and I think for the Kios, as for many families, it just contributed to a real hatred of the English which started to mani manifest itself for sure as, as Keo grew up. He started school early. He started school when he was eight. That year his father died and, and uh, you know, it sent the family into turmoil and I'm sure sending him off to school was, was probably a smart thing. He was a very good student and he was an avid reader. And they said one of his, his great enjoyments was reading military stories. Um, did that, did that um, um, start his desire to be a soldier? Well, who knows, but it certainly could have added to, to whatever the attraction was. And yes, he did start to think about soldiering as, a, you know, as a way of life. Um, and what became very clear to, to Keo as he grew up was that he would never, he would never fight under the English flag. I mean, there was this hatred, this, this hatred of England. Some of it was, was um, you know, rather cosmic, what the English had done to the Irish, but some of it was very personal. His mother had come from money and uh, in a family that had been around for a couple hundred years and in a previous era, uh, the crown had seized the family's land. And from then on, they leased land for, for the rest of their time, you know, with any sort of spread of land. That was said rather awkwardly, but you know what I'm saying. Um, and more personally, an uncle of Miles, one of his father's brothers was hanged by the British. So Miles, along with the rest of the family hated the English and you know he would never ever fight for them. He would take his talents if they materialized to other lands. When, when he was 20, it was now 1860, he had his first first opportunity to see if, if soldiering was was going to be a good fit. At that point, Italy was thinking about unification. Italy for hundreds of years had been a very loose confederation of duchies and kingdoms. Um, the names come down to us. In fact, if you're Italian or if you know Italians, they tend to say, yes, they're Italian, but they'll say that they are Venetian or they're from Florence or the family is from Lombardy or Naples or Sicily. You know, it, it becomes rather particular to the area. And that started back when these duchies and kingdoms really were uh, pretty independent and often much closer aligned to the surrounding countries than to each other. But now the Italians, the Italians realized that a unified country, a strong unified country was very important. However, there was a stumbling block and the stumbling block was the Pope. Uh, at that point, it was Pope Pius IX. The Pope, the Popes and the papacy had owned land in Italy for hundreds of years. And it was quite a big track. I mean, um, picture Italy, you, you know, it's shaped like a boot, right? Um, a, a boot to the knee, a high boot with a, with a high heel. Yes, okay. Um, you've got that picture. The Pope, the papacy owned land um, a couple of hundred miles wide and it stretched from the Mediterranean to the Adriatic, rather like a cummerbund across the shank of the boot. Um, the Pope had no problem with unification. Oh, fine idea, fine idea. Just leave him out of it, thank you very much. Um, he wanted no part of it. And the only problem was armies from these duchies and kingdoms were approaching from the north and from the south looking to you know, unify the whole and the Pope had no army. So his, his, his emissaries fanned out across Europe and into Ireland, exhorting young Catholic men to come and fight for their Pope. And about 1400 from Ireland came over, miles amongst them. And overall about 18,000 men uh, made their way to Italy. They trained you know, a little bit haphazardly, but they trained, they were outfitted, perhaps not Derogur, but nevertheless. And um, the papal army was ready to fight. And now it was September, 1860. There were four battles. It's ranged over 18 days in total. And the Pope lost his lands. He lost all of it. He lost those four battles. And now he was left with Rome and a little bit beyond. And now we know he doesn't even have that much. He has the Vatican. 
Um, so it certainly was a defeat for for the um, for the the papal army and the young men that were part of it. But um, for miles, for miles, it was a it was a good move. Um, soldiering was going to be a good fit. He was he was brave. He was aggressive. He was wanting to be in the middle of things. And I will tell you that um, I thought even early on as I read about him and started to dig, dig and dig and dig, um, I'm gonna put it in today's vernacular, but I will tell you that Miles Kehoe was an action junkie. That was my, that is what I think of Miles. He, he just had to be in the middle of things. Um, and the Pope, the Pope recognized this with a medal, a medal to the, to the honor of St. Gregory, and it came from the Pope specifically to Miles. Um, but now you had a lot of out of work, a, a lot of out of work soldiers, most of them went home, most of them went home to their countries and their jobs. But some of the Irish contingent were invited, invited to Rome by the Pope to join the um, Papal Guard. Um, it's a ceremonial post, but it is very important. It was then, it still is, um, you know, it's a grand gesture and Miles accepted. But remember what I said about the action junkie, well, he found it boring and he didn't want to hang around very long. I mean, you know, they had those uniforms with the big pleated things and those hats that look rather like Venetian boats. Yes, all right. Um, fine for a lot of them, but not for Miles. But Here's the thing, you know, they say that uh, that timing is everything, right? And, uh, oh, well, maybe not everything, but it certainly does, you know, it figures in a lot. And now we in the United States were starting the second year of that hideous, bloody civil war. You know, this was that thing that um, back in the spring, a year before spring of 1861, oh, it was that insurrection, right? You know, the rebels stormed Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor. Ah, I mean, it was a nuisance and it was going to take several months to quiet down, but yeah, you know, not such a big thing. It was, it was going to kind of wear itself out, shall we say? Well, obviously not so. We were in the start of a, a really hideous four years of, of, of destruction. And now, in the start of the second year, the union was running out of officers. One year, and they're out of officers. The backstory to that is that the US Army, before the war, uh, numbered about 16,000 men um, from all over the country, and they were mostly spread out amongst the Western forts. Um, they were charged with you know, fighting the Indians and, and protecting the settlers and protecting the stagecoaches as they went through and the, the railroads and those you know, laying the ties for more and more railroads, all of that stuff. Um, and as I say, they came from all over. The, the officers, almost to a man, had gone through West Point. Um, but more of them than not were Southerners, um, military training, military um, as, a, as a life's occupation, much more of a Southern tradition than in the North. And now as the Southern states seceded from the Union, those officers resigned their commissions and joined the Confederate Army of, of America. And that's what left the Union in need of officers. Um, but now at the same point, there were some out of work soldiers, you know, kind of hanging around Rome, not sure of what their next move was. And we in the United States, the government sent some of our, our high placed Americans over to Rome amongst them, a couple of archbishops, the Archbishop of Cincinnati, the Archbishop of New York. They went to Rome to see if they couldn't woo some of these young men uh, over to serve for us while Miles Kehoe jumped at the chance. Um, and he was, you know, even at that age, I think he was very, very intent on what, what he wanted and where he was going, even, you know, even as he took those first steps. He had been a, an officer in the Papal Army. He had been a lieutenant, and now he wanted an upgrade, and he got it. Uh, he got, he obtained for himself a captaincy in the U.S. Volunteer Army, and he and a couple of his buddies from, from Ireland that had also served with the Pope, went home to Ireland uh, for miles. Uh, his mother had died that year, earlier that year. And so obviously he was paying his respects. And I dare say that, uh, that as he bid the country goodbye, he, he looked at it knowing that he would never, something told him he would never see it 
in quite the same way again. Um, and with that, the three, they hit, they hit New York and stayed for a couple of days and uh, probably saw the sights. And then they went to Washington and within, within a matter of a couple of weeks, they were on the battlefield. And that schedule was very usual then. I mean, you hit Washington and then you were, you were on the line. Um, for Miles, that first assignment um, was in the Shenandoah Valley campaign, the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. Um, his, his commander was a General James Shields, who also had left Ireland as a young man. And I, I wonder if there might have been a little personal connection, you know, a handshake that said, you know, how are you, lad? And, 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 and good to have you here on American soil. Well, who knows? I'm being a little bit uh, um, dramatic there, but it, it's, uh, it's my thought anyway. Um, the commander of the Confederates was Stonewall Jackson, and this was a resounding Confederate win. There were six battles, the Confederates won five of them and we won one, but first time out, Keogh got himself a footnote in history. He came within a hair's breadth of capturing Stonewall Jackson. They were, Jackson and his, and his staff were in a farmhouse of a Sunday morning, relaxing and, um, you know, making ready to go to church. I uh, appreciate that this was English, English fighting, which is that things were planned. It wasn't just, you know, um, as, as the Indians, as, as my story will, will, will tell you, the Indians attacked him whenever they felt like it. So as I say, there was this break, it was a Sunday morning. However, Keogh led a raiding party. And they say that, um, that Jackson got out a window and if Little Sorrel hadn't been tacked up so that he just literally leapt into the saddle and got away, he would have been captured and some of his staff was. So, you know, first time out, first time out a staff officer as a captain, which would be his his uh, calling all the way through the army, through the war, and uh, as I say, he he already attracted attention for his his ability. Um, I like to say he was one year late to the war, but for them up from then on, Miles Keogh fought all the way through for the next four years, um, in more than eighty battles. He fought in some of the big ones, Brandy Station, which was the largest and, and still is the largest uh, cavalry battle on the North American continent. Gettysburg, that horrible three-day battle that in time was, was realized as the turning point in the war. And many, many more that um, some of the names we know and many of them are, are just in the ledgers for the historians to note the, uh, the wins and losses on either side, the, the wounded, the dead, the killing, the, the missing in action, all of that. Um, he was never wounded. He was imprisoned in a Confederate prison for a couple of, for two months. And he wrote his sister, Ellen, back in Ireland, and he said it nearly broke him. He was breveted twice. Brevets were the, the ceremonial awards of the time. Uh, they are no longer used now. We have medals, but a brevet gave you an elevation in rank, a ceremonial elevation that can be, that could be used. Um, he was breveted to, from captain to major and then to lieutenant, lieutenant colonel. But interestingly uh, about, about Keogh, to my way of thinking, um, and perhaps something of the fiber of the man, he never ever used his breveted ranks. He was always Captain Keogh all the way through. And that could not be said for a lot of them, including General Custer, George Custer, whose generalship was a was a, a brevet. Um, as I say, never wounded, always a staff officer. And one more thing, he lost his beloved horse, Tom. Echo. And he wrote his, he wrote Ellen and he said, I will never ever have a horse like Tom again. I am brokenhearted. And when I wrote that, I said, you know, hang in there, Keo. You're going to have one. It's going to take a while. It's going to take a, a, a few years, but you're going to have that very special horse again. By the end of the, of the Civil War, he quite liked us and he decided he was going to stay. Um, he wrote his brother Tom back in Ireland. And Tom, Tom would always be the mainstay for him, that connection to home. Tom, Tom stayed in County Carlow. He moved from Leyland Bridge eventually, but not very far away. And so, as I say, that was that rock and that anchor, perhaps. And he said to Tom, he said, America is a place where a clever man can make his way, a clever young man can make his way on his abilities, not who he is, what the family is, where the where the the money came from, all of that, that station in life, all of those very European uh, attitudes. It was really you, 
you know, and what you were capable of. Um, and he was going to stay in the military. He liked soldiering. He was good at it. And that was going to be, that was his life's calling. Um, now the cavalry was coming up and running again. Um, there had been several cavalry units before the Civil War that had, been, they had all been brought down to skeletal skeletal level, shall we say. Um, most of the men pulled out of the, of the various um, cavalry forts and, and sent to the Civil War. But now post-war, they were up and running and some new, new units were coming online, including the 7th Cavalry, um, which in, in due time had, had um, um, very good adjectives uh, connected to it, such as illustrious. Um, and it was commanded by that young firebrand General George Armstrong Custer. Um, the 7th Cavalry was commissioned at Fort Riley in the late summer of 1866, and Miles Keogh reported for duty in the fall of that year. He was given command of Company I, and that would be his command throughout Company I. He brought his men together and they put together a wagon train. They were going to go all the way across Kansas. And this now was the frontier. This was open, desolate, Barren, barren land, Kansas, Nebraska, all of that. I mean, this was not the East anymore and nothing like it. They were gonna go all the way across that state to the farthest 7th Cavalry outpost before the Colorado border. And that was Fort Wallace, which came to be known as the fightingest fort in the West. Um, they put together a wagon train and a word about wagon trains. Um, you know, when a family or two or three decided to head west. You know, they left that settled western Pennsylvania or that settled eastern Ohio, you know, those areas, and they were going to head on out for, for whatever reasons they did. Um, there might be one or two or three families that coupled together for community and for protection. Um, their wagon trains were very modest, but they're sort of what we know, you know, what you see on television in the movies. So there would be um, one of those Conestoga wagons, you know, with a big round top that's covered in fabric, right? And there's kind of a bench seat up front and dad would be in the driver seat managing the, the horse team, which was probably two horses and, and mother or somebody sitting beside him and all their worldly possessions are in that Conestoga wagon. Um, a couple of cows loping along beside them and, uh, and whatever ho other horses the family owned would be ridden by likely the men of the family, maybe some, maybe some tomboy girl, but you know what I'm saying. And, and so that pod, um, if you had two or three families, that would be replicate it. My point being that if you stood somewhere um, out in the open where you could get a good shot, you could see the beginning and the end of that wagon train. You know, it was manageable size. Quite a different situation where the army was concerned. Um, when the army put together a wagon train, it would be from huge to, let's say, humongous. Uh, George Custer was known for putting together a few that were three miles long and a half a mile wide, okay? And obviously outriders on the edges to tell those cattle and pack horses that no, 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 you don't hang a left or a right, you know, you keep going. I mean, just imagine that. And they took, I mean, a wagon train took everything that was needed for the journey. And you're talking about a company generally, if not more than one company. So you're talking about, you know, housing and food and clothing and, and weapons and other tools and everything, right? Um, and, and all the cavalry would be mounted on their horses. But in, in beyond that, you, you need pack horses. Um, things happen to horses, you know? I mean, they broke their legs. They, they died for other reasons. Um, so you needed extras and they were, you know, they were loaded too. You took cattle for slaughter. I mean, all of that. So you can imagine. So you needed all of that for the journey. And wagon trains went between, they say, 10 and 20 miles a day. And that depended on terrain and weather and events, accidents, a broken wheel, a broken horse. I mean, the broken, you know what I'm saying, a broken leg or for whatever other reason, a horse was out of commission. Um, and then you needed everything for whatever you were going to do when you got there. You know, whether that be a, a, a protracted Indian fight, because there was, you know, there were Indians in an area, and so you were really going to address the problem. Or in the case of these men, they were going to a new fort, Fort Wallace. Um, they were basically going to, to set up housekeeping, if you will. 
So that gives you the whole picture. Um, and, and so they set out, they rolled into Fort Wallace after Thanksgiving of that year, 1866. Fort Wallace was supposedly uh, complete and ready for, uh, ready for service. And uh, a lot of lying had gone on and it wasn't complete, not by a long shot. But the thing about the cavalry in those days is that particularly after the Civil War, the cavalry was a job. And as immigrants um, flooded into our country um, and you know, crammed into the big cities and, and experienced bias and bigotry and, and all of that that the new immigrant experiences so, so many times, um, the cavalry was a paycheck, a steady paycheck, a job. And because it had a certain patriotic um, um, air to it, um, it, it tended to elevate those that took those jobs. Um, a lot of them didn't ride a horse and didn't know how to shoot a rifle. And they had to learn all of that. And it was on the job training, but they came with their other skills, you know, carpentry and stonemasonry and bricklaying and pipe fitting and all of that. And so in this case and in many other cases, um, their worth was, was, uh, was uh, wonderful and they set to work finishing Fort Wallace. Um, this was this was Indian territory. This was the territory of the southern the southern tribes, the nomads, the ones that did not want to go on a reservation. Their life was following the buffalo. The buffalo was everything to them. The buffalo gave them meat. The buffalo gave them skins to clothe them, to rugs to lie on, rugs to cover them at night, the the hides to cover the tents. Um, bones carved into utensils to carved into um fighting fighting um apparatus um all of it the only thing the buffalo didn't give them were the long poles to set up the teepees and the buffalo followed the grasses and the grasses in a matter of speaking followed followed the sun and the seasons and then circled round year after year after year and they didn't want to go on the reservations and they were fighting not just for their lives individually but for their for their existence, for their civilization. And their historians will tell you today, they didn't want to fight. They just didn't know why. They didn't know why we couldn't all just live, you know, their way for them and our way for us. However, however, we had manifest de destiny on our side, you know, it, um, that, that principle that had been, had been laid upon us, that this was our land to take, that God said we must, we must take it. And if we and if need be, we send send away those that are in our way. So that was the conflict, and the fighting was fierce. It was much different than fighting in the Civil War. I mean, this is not Indian fighting. These were these were Indians that would swoop down on a fort fort and torch the hay and stampede the horses. And by the time our cavalry got mounted up and went chasing after them, they had disappeared into the purple hills and the haze. And, and uh, Keo was frustrated and told his superiors, you know, this is ridiculous. We should be able to go after them and find them where they live and, and fight them on their territory. And he was told that's not the way we do things. You know, sorry, sorry, the blue coats go in formation and, you know, and as, as per the movies. Um, and that was a situation that was presented to them and what they were fighting their way through. 1868, Keogh was back east at Fort Leavenworth, just over the Kansas line in Missouri, um, just called for whatever reason as cavalry officers often were as military officers are today. And it was that at that point that he found this very special horse. This next one that it must have been in his in his mind to find that he was looking for. He never lacked for a horse. I mean, the cavalry the cavalry um, was built on horses, so to speak. I mean, there was always a horse for you, and there was always a replacement. But there was that one that that uh, that um, that he was looking for again after losing Tom, and that was the horse to be named Comanche. Um, there are a couple of stories about where he found him, so I guess it depends what you like. Um, he might have, there was at Fort Leavenworth, a shipment of 41 horses that had come in from the high desert in, the, in South Texas, Mustangs wrangled from the, from the desert down there, um, now, now ready for, for uh, signage by the 7th Cavalry to replace horses that had been lost the previous winter. He might have seen him in a corral, you know, and there was just that connection, which is a story that I sort of like. But um, there are also stories that Comanche was a replacement horse in an Indian fight when the horse that he was 
was riding either got shot out from under him or otherwise was disabled and now he was given this other horse but apparently at some point he was riding comanche in a fight and the and the horse took an arrow to his flank but in the in the terrible din of battle uh keo keo didn't hear anything and comanche apparently never never flinched he just, he just kept allowing Keo to ride him and fight. And it wasn't until they got back to the fort that night when it was discovered that yes, there was a, an arrow in, in his side and uh, he was apparently very stoic as the farrier extracted it. Um, and these were qualities that, that Keo very much liked. And so the name Comanche then stuck. Um, for the Comanche Indians, I would imagine who were always considered the best of the Indian fighters. Um, it began for them an eight year association, which in those times in the cavalry was an eternity for, for both, for either. I mean, that they would stay together that long was just, just beyond, beyond what, what normally happens. And they had many, many assignments together. They went back in the South to help with reconstruction, which I'm sure you know was um, after the Civil War ended, there was a period of 12 years when the South uh, became militarized and the army army um, occupied as they worked out how these states would come back into the Union. Uh, they were up north uh, protecting the surveyors as they laid the final boundary between the U.S. and Canada up in the area of, of um, Minnesota. And then in 1873, the whole 7th Cavalry, all 12, 12 companies were pulled pulled back from the various forts and sent to Fort Abraham Lincoln, another new fort, a fo fort just outside Bismarck, North Dakota. Um, the Indian problem in this, on the Southern Plains was, was somewhat settled at that point, um, at least quieted down, and, but not so in the North. And this was the area of the Lakota Sioux, the powerful Lakota Sioux of the of the Sioux Nation and, uh, and others of, of their their colleagues, um, the Lakota Sioux with their their famous old sitting bull at their head. And they were still fighting for the same reason. There had been the government had had created um, had created a. Uh, um, an area for them, a reservation for them in, in within the Black Hills. Um, and they were encouraging the Indians to go on to the reservation. And many did, many did over time. They just kind of gave up, um, even though they didn't want to give up this nomadic lifestyle. Um, you know, it's just the way it was and they, and they acquiesced, but many did not. Um, they lived outside the reservation, a lot of them, quietly, all of this under the radar. Um, there were prospectors that were coming into the Black Hills looking for gold and with some settlers, but all of this rather like a, a low simmering pot on the back burner. Nobody was causing anybody any problems. There had been a treaty of Fort Laramie that said that the Black Hills were sacred to the Indians. Um, that we would not go on without their permission. They would not do, you know, reciprocal things without ours and, and so forth and so on and so on. And um, as I say, even though where there were some, some um, um, bending of the rules, that was the situation. However, in 1874, General Custer decided it was time to find out just how much gold was in the Black Hills. And so he put together an expedition and he put together a wagon train. And this was one of those three miles by half a mile wagon trains. They went into the Black Hills to find out if there was what they called mineable, marketable amounts of gold. That was, that was the, the uh, however, the, the stated purpose was to, for the government to find a site to build a fort for the protection of both the Indians and the white man. That's what they said. But of course, the looking for the gold was the real reason. Um, Custer took cavalry and, and mounted cavalry and pack horses and cattle and prospectors and on and on and on and on. And, and he took a reporter. And I don't know whether he took the reporter because he had a big ego, which he did, or to have, have this factually stated. This was a reporter for the Chicago Inter-Ocean. Isn't that a great name? A paper in Chicago between the oceans, the Chicago Inter-Ocean. Um, yes, they did find gold. And they did find gold in mineable, marketable amounts. 
And the reporter went back to his newspaper and he filed a story and the newspaper put it on the wire. And now it went all over the country. And now there was a gold rush. For the country, this was not such a bad thing. Um, the last gold rush had been 1848 at Sutter's Mill in, in Northern California. So it had been a long time ago. At the beginning of the 1870s, there had been a depression in the country. So the idea of a gold rush and elevated economy, all of that for the country was good. For the Indians, it was horrible because now the prospectors flooded into the Black Hills, the sacred Black Hills protected by that treaty. They flooded in, the settlers, their families came, other settlers came. Now there were more and more incidents between the Indians and the white men. And now the government, our government was faced with, do you, do you uphold the sanctity of the Black Hills and the Treaty of Fort Laramie, or do you protect your citizens? And obviously they protected U.S. citizens as, as we do. And the treaty went up in smoke, you know, not worth the paper it was written on. And now there was a real problem. They pushed as many, you know, exhorted as many, many Indians as they could to go on the Great Sioux Reservation. Meanwhile, meanwhile, Sitting Bull said, don't come to the Spring Festival. Every year there had been a festival along the banks of the Little Bighorn River, which was a tributary, excuse me, a tributary in southeastern Montana, out in the wilderness there, southeastern Montana. Um, if you look at a map, there is a whole gaggle of, of rivers in that part, the Missouri Legion to the Yellowstone and the Powder, and then into the Bighorn. And then there is this tributary that comes out of, out of northern Wyoming, which is the Little Bighorn. And each spring, there was an Indian festival along the banks of that river that was every year of moderate size. A few tribes that would pitch their teepees along, along the banks. They say that usually there were about 800 braves. 800, the braves were kind of the operable number because obviously they, they were the fighters if, if, if it ever came to that. Um, so there were about 800. But as I say, this year, Sitting Bull told his people, he said, don't go on the reservation, stay out and go to the festival. Meanwhile, the government, our government had said that as of the end of January, 1876, to be exact, January 31st, any Indian that was not on the reservation would be considered hostile and we could take punitive action. And that meant we could shoot them, simple as that. Um, and, and we also planned that, that it was time now to address and somehow end or at least really bank down this Indian problem. Um, the commander of forces in that part of our country, a General Alfred Terry, called officers together early in 1876. And their plan was that three contingents would, would move toward the Little Bighorn, all of them meeting on June 26th of that year. Uh, there was a contingent coming from Western Montana. There was one coming from Northern Wyoming and there was Custer's group of 12 companies, the 7th Regiment coming from Abraham, from Fort Abraham Lincoln, and there were some others from that fort as well. Um, bear in mind that communication was what, wasn't what what we have today, right? There are no smartphones, okay. Um, and in that part of the world, although we had telegraph, you know, you have to have, you have to have sending stations and receiving stations, and you might have one, but if you don't have the other, it doesn't work. So you plan and then you hope. Uh, and the plan was that they would all set out in mid-May and they would meet June 26. Um, what, couldn't, what couldn't be known was that the group from Western Montana was a couple of days late getting there. The winter, that winter had been particularly long and severe. The group from Northern Montana got attacked by Indians and they had to pull out. They had, they had wounded, they had dead. So they were totally out of the picture, which was not known. And so Custer himself, wound up at the mouth of the Little Bighorn, and it was actually one day early, and that was June 25th. Um, they knew who he was. They knew him to be very ambitious. They knew him to be aggressive. He had been known for that in the Civil War, and Terry actually said to him, George, wait. There will be glory for all of us. There will be enough to go around. Wait for the rest of us, but he did not, 
And I'm not going to litigate the battle. You can do that. It's on the blogs. They're still fighting the battle of the Little Big Horn. So I will just give you some of the, some of the highlights, which is to say, we don't know why he didn't wait. He had, a, he had another plan in his mind, and he went ahead. Excuse me, I didn't. Oh, my phone is, is off. I'm sorry. Oh. I'm so sorry. That's terrible. I, I apologize. Um, we don't know why he wait, why he didn't wait. Um, what we know is that he took his regimen of 12 companies. He divided, he he put one in the back as as the holding holding extra ammunition and horses. He took another three companies and he 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 put them aside to kind of hang back as needed for extra help whenever. He took another three companies and he said they would attack the south end of the of the of the uh, festival. The Indians would be surprised and they would get to kill many of them. And he and five companies were heading up the bank of the Little Bighorn. Um, and what we know is that they disappeared in the trees. And Custer and his five companies under his direct command, with Miles Kehoe as his senior most captain. Um, in charge of Company I and also one other. Um, an hour later, they were all dead. 210 men uh, killed by the Indians and 70 horses and the rest of the horses taken by the Indians as they always did. And there are all the theories in the world and the site has been excavated and this, that and the other thing. But the truth is only the Indians know what happened. Um, they say that the fight took about an hour as long as it took to eat a meal. They said that Miles Kehoe was the bravest man they'd ever seen and that he was he he was either the last to die or one of the last to die. He had stood, he had been astride Comanche all the way through. So that would have been tough, one tough, solid horse as as the Indians were throwing a, a human noose around the last stand hill and, and just killing everybody one by one. Um, at the end, a bullet went through Comanche's left breast through the flesh and shattered Keo's knee, his left knee, and toppled, toppled the captain, pulled himself under Comanche and fired his last shots and then was, was finished off by one of the Indians. But in death, he hung on to Comanche's reins. And one of the Indians said he wanted that horse. He was wounded, but he was going to, he was going to be okay, but he wouldn't break that bond. Two days later, the rescue party got to the Little Bighorn, to that open area News had, had trickled through from some, some of the scouts. They sort of knew what they were going to find, but then they were in the midst of the absolute horror of it. And yet in the middle, there was a horse standing. He was pretty beaten down. He was bloody. He was dehydrated. He was famished. He was sunbaked. His head was down. But he heard their voices, and I think he recognized Henry Nolan, who was Keo's best friend. And they say he whinnied, and, and you'd have to think that in the middle of this horror, this moment of joy, that the captain's horse was alive. And they, the, men, the men went to him, and they pulled grasses, and they got water from the river in their caps, and they washed him down. And then someone broke out a bottle of Hennessy brandy. And uh, that seemed to do the trick and revive Rod Comanche, and that night they walked off the field four and a half miles to where some of the country was, some, one of the other companies was holed up. And over the next three nights, they made it all the way up the Little Bighorn to where the far west was moored, ready to take the injured from, that had attacked the south end of the, the company. Some of them had survived, take the injured back to Fort Abraham Lincoln. Uh, Comanche stayed up river with some of the rescue party. He didn't go down to um, Abraham to Fort Lincoln for another six weeks. But by then, his fame had preceded him. The first, the first news dispatches that had come out of, out of this horror hit the newspapers about a week later. Again, remember, there was, there, was no, there was no telegraph in that part of the world, so they couldn't even send anything until they got back to Bismarck. But in those first dispatches, they said, the captain's horse, Captain Keogh's brave Comanche survived. The country was horrified. This was the eve, by now it was the eve of the 4th of July celebrations. And we were 100 years old, 1776, now 1876. 100 years old, and we were proud of ourselves. We've done pretty darn well in 100 years, by golly. 
And we had we had grander celebrations planned than ever before. And now this struck and people were, they were horrified. They were angry. How could this have happened? People were led to believe that the Indian problem was pretty well abated, you know? I mean, unless you were out in that area to know. I mean, our thoughts were, were going beyond that, right? I mean, uh, as people do, they tend to forget about things that are out of their ken, so to speak. You know, and now this just hit hit the country full on. They wanted They wanted answers. How could this have happened? And then in the middle of that, I think, to to have this horse survive. I liken it to, you know, you'll, you'll see on TV or you'll see in the newspapers, there's been a terrible fire, usually in, in the middle of a city, you know, a, a, a block of row houses, right? And the flames have jumped from one to the other. And now there's this, this kind of like this, this the mass of flames, I won't try that word, um, this mass of flames and, and everything is burning in, in, in the, against the night sky. And at some point, at some point they throw a baby out of a second floor window, right? And the firemen catch it. And, and, and the news the next day is, oh, thank goodness the baby survived. I mean, you think about how we, you know, we'll grab onto that thing. And I think Comanche was that for people. They embraced him. They embraced him figuratively and literally. I mean, he was their golden boy. And the army absolutely encouraged this because they let people focus on this. I mean, he was the best PR the army ever had. People could focus on Comanche, the great Comanche. And then behind, you know, they're his back and people's backs, they, they finished off what had to be done. Um, Comanche, by the time he got back to, to the fort, as I say, he was, he was already famous. Um, he was made the second commanding officer of the 7th Cavalry by official order, by official written order. It had never happened before, and I don't believe it has ever happened since to a, to a horse. Uh, he was given full reign of the, court, of, the, of, the, of the fort. He was their mascot. He was their, their total indulgence. Um, there were there were formal orders for for his care. He was still to have the diet that Kehoe gave him. Sometimes a special mixture of of grains and so forth, because Kehoe was a consummate horseman from from the very early days in Ireland. I mean, he just knew horses. Um, he was never to be ridden, although it turned out the commander's daughter had been riding him a little bit, and that was its own brouhaha. But never ridden. Um, he knew where the beer, his beer bucket would be. He knew who baked the best biscuits. Uh, if you had hung out the laundry of a morning and Comanche came along and spied a, a sunflower, you know, the other side of your laundry and went plowing through your laundry to get at it, you might complain to your husband, but that's as far as it went. You know, he did no wrong. He absolutely did no wrong. He had a new friend. Um, a man by the name of Gustav Korn, another immigrant from Central Europe. And Korn had stepped up right, right at the time. He was actually even on the battlefield to the French Comanche. And, and over time, they were buddies longer than, uh, than Comanche and Keo even. Um, they had a routine for the most part at four o'clock in the afternoon, Keo, uh, Korn rather, would, would uh, arrive at Comanche's stall. So that meant that even Comanche knew to come back by that time and he would get a rub down and then he'd get dinner. And occasionally Corn, for whatever reason didn't get there and Comanche would go looking for him. He had the run as I say of, of the fort and he'd find him and you know, kind of bring him back for that, that meeting. Um, and you know, that was fine. Um, the ladies taught Comanche how to play kickball. They would take him out on the parade ground at his set and toss the ball and he'd learn to kick it with his front feet. So he was, he was totally there. Their, their, um, their beloved, their beloved mascot. The only thing he was asked each year, there was a parade, a memorial parade in honor of the men that had been lost. And he was draped in black. Comanche became the caparisoned horse, the riderless horse, if you will, draped in black with this, with the boots uh, reversed in the stirrups, and the and the sword moved to the other side. That was that was his one official duty, um, and and that was life for many many years until in 1887, the Seventh Cavalry was actually moved back to to their starting point, Fort Riley. And then, and then sometimes there was a bit of a change. Corn, as it turned out, uh, found a lady friend in Junction City, which is about five miles from, from the fort. So sometimes he didn't show up for that four o'clock meeting. 
And uh, this apparently was uh, was just a joke at the fort because they said Comanche would go looking and he'd go all around the fort, but now he didn't find corn. And they said he just instinctively knew where he was and he would head down the Junction City Road. He knew the house. When he got to Junction City, he knew the house and he would stand in front and he would bang on the gate with his front hooves and corn would come out because he knew exactly what was going on. And that was like the end of his, uh, his day with his lady friend. And um, he and Comanche would head back down the road to the fort. Um, Comanche lived to be very old. He lived to be 29. And in the last year, he, he clearly, clearly faded away. Um, what had happened was the year before, in 1890, there was one last battle of some, of some note, and that was the Battle of Wounded Knee. Some of you may, may know Dee Brown's book, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. That's such a, such a, a gorgeous title. Um, it turned out that on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota, there were some Indians that were doing a dance. It was called the Ghost Dance. And um, they said it was it was simply about their their um, their culture renewal and thanks and all of those those themes of those those positive themes. The army was afraid that it might be a, a war dance or a precursor to a war dance, and they ordered the Seventh Cavalry to move up to South Dakota to the reservation and just find out what was going on, just kind of show a little muscle. And they came up with their rifles and they surrounded, they surrounded the village. And then a shot ran out. And um, to this day, it is not absolutely, you know, agreed upon as to which, which side fired first, but it turned into a melee and a bloodbath. Um, and, and some will call it uh, kind of the book end to, to Little Bighorn because this time rather than 200, all so many cavalry died, 31 cavalry died and, and at least a couple hundred Indians. Um, Comanche was there, he was there in the back with the pack. He didn't see Gustav Korn die, but, but, uh, but yes, it was the end for Korn. Comanche went back to um, Fort Riley but Corn never came back, never showed up at his stall, and he went looking and he went looking. But for an animal, he'd been abandoned because Corn never did 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 materialize. And they say he grew depressed and he started to lay around and and the beer wasn't fun anymore. And he hung out in mud wallers and 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 just you know totally totally gave up the ghost, so to speak. By the summer, the officers knew they they really knew they were losing Comanche. And they had a meeting and they said they just, they felt like they just couldn't bear to let him go, you know, just bury him and be done with it. And so they decided that, that perhaps they could preserve him. And they contacted a famous taxidermist in the state in Kansas by the name of Lewis Lindsay Dyke at the University of Kansas. And they asked him if he would be interested, if he would do this when the time came. And he said, yes, he would. And they agreed upon a fee of $400. Um, Comanche died November 7th, 1891 of colic. Uh, that was a, a Saturday and they telegraphed Professor Dyke right away and he came to Fort Riley, he arrived the next day, Sunday, and it took him two days, but he did what he needed to do, which was harvest the hide and, and most of the bones, all the major bones and, and, and whatever else he needed. The rest of Comanche was given a burial with full military honors. Um, at Fort Riley, and then, and then Professor Dyke went back to Kansas, and he worked on Comanche, and he recreated him over a two-year period. 1893, he was ready for the cavalry, and the cavalry did not pay. $400 is not forthcoming. And you know, I think probably Dyke was just perfectly happy with that, because now he and the University of Kansas owned Comanche. You know, I can't speak for him, but that's what I think. Anyway, he took Comanche that spring to Chicago to the World Columbian Exposition. That was that huge six month exposition in Chicago. It's called the White City or it was called the White City. All the buildings were painted white. He installed Comanche in the Kansas Pavilion and he was one of the hits of the show. Thousands of people came to see him. Um, he, was, he was easily as popular in death as he had been in life. And at the end, Dyke took him back to Kansas, and he's been there for 127 years. 
Uh, initially, he was he was installed in uh, in Dyke Hall, but out in the open, there was no casing, um, and he became the beloved the beloved talisman of the students. Before a, a test, they would rub his nose and they would pull tail feathers. And I can tell you, I'm pretty good authority that the tail he has now is probably several generations from that that one that that uh, Dyke left him with. Um, He's had a couple of rough goes. At one point, he was almost drowned when a when a faucet was left open on an upper floor and all the water poured down. He's been um, um, recast, shall we say, or or a full body uplift, however you want to put it, twice. Um, the last time in 2005, and at that point, he was installed in a fabulous glass case with climate control and perfect lighting and signage and and uh, pictures that I have seen show him to be uh, surely as, as spit shined and polished as that day when he and, and Keo cantered out of, of, of Fort Lincoln on the way to Little Bighorn. Um, interestingly, a couple of the of the groups that initially cast him off, uh, Fort Riley and the Seventh Cavalry, you know, for whatever their reasons, they they didn't pay their bill. Um, and also the people that ran the Little Bighorn Battlefield, well, you know, they wanted him. He, he shouldn't be at, at the University of Kansas. He's better off at, you know, Fort Riley or, or the other. And um, the chancellor at that time said, no way. Uh-uh, he stays at the University of Kansas. He's very happy here, and this is where he's going to be. And as I say, he's been there 127 years. He has had well over a million visitors from all over this country and all over the world that come in and, and stare at this amazing horse, um, you know, with the, with, the, with the strength and resolve to stand for the cavalry and, 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 and America. Um, and so Comanche found his place in history and he brought Keo along, who, who for many is not nearly so well known or known at all, but Keo has found his place. And for me, the, the interesting part of the story is that it has legs. It still, it still goes on in a way. I mean, yes, Comanche is where he is and still, still greeting visitors. As for Miles Kehoe, the year after he died, a fort was named after him, Fort Kehoe, and one was named for Custer. And this was not unusual. Um, good commanders often had forts named for them in those years. Um, but many of them, many of them just um, have disappeared from from the face of the earth. They were they were used for however long the army needed them, 20 years, 30 years, at which point they were just they were decommissioned and the army just walked out the front door and closed it and 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 off they went. Um, locals many times came and took every board and every brick and every usable piece of metal and carted it off to build something else and you know in that in that time in those days in the, that part of the world um fort keogh being near miles city montana not a bad idea you know reusing the materials and so as i say um they are they are dust to dust um biblically speaking. Um, and others were left to rot and then some concerned citizens came by and stopped the rot and opened a gift shop and put up some signs and now we have, you know, tourist attractions where you can go and see how things once were. Fort Keogh has been and has now in its third re reincarnation and still going strong. Yes, it was a fort originally from which the cavalry went forth to, fi to fight some more Indians. After that, it became a remount station. Uh, we sent hundreds of thousands of horses to the battlefields of World War One, before we before we entered the war and and after. And Fort Keogh was the um, sent more horses than any of the other remount stations to the, to the World War One fronts. Um, after that, it had a few years of a few few years of downtime, and then the U.S. Department of Agriculture came in and took it over, and they're still running it today. It is now the Fort Keogh um, Livestock and Range Research Laboratory. I had to think about all those names together. It works to improve uh, livestock in the area, and, um, mostly the beef cattle herds. It works with the ranchers and the farmers. It works on crop rotation and water delivery, and also some work to, to uh, preserve the, the indigenous um, animals in that part of the country. And so, you know, Fort Keogh keeps, keeps trucking along, as they say. Um, in closing, let me, let me offer a suggestion, okay? Next time you're, uh, you're driving across Kansas, 
No, no, you never know. You might, you might. You're coming across Kansas, you're on Interstate 70. That's that ribbon of highway, straight as an arrow, goes right across the center of the state. So get off at Lawrence. Now it's pretty close to the Kansas border. Get off at Lawrence, that's where the University of Kansas is. Find the campus, find Dyke Hall, that's where the Natural History Museum is. Comanche is on the main floor and he's waiting for you. So stop in and say hello. And if you think about it, yes, say hello for me too. Comanche would love it. That's their story, Comanche and his captain. I hope you enjoyed it. I was happy to tell you, thank you very much. And to you, thank you very much for, for joining me for this. Um, let me, let me just, just put this up. Uh, if you like the story, there is a book, Comanche and his captain, my book, Comanche and his captain, the war horse and the soldier of fortune. Um, it is available on Amazon. And if you would prefer to buy from me, either a signed copy or for whatever reason you'd like, like, like me to send one, um, my phone number is 860-526-5431. That's 860-526-5431. I'm in Chester, Connecticut, and I'm in the phone book. Or you can email me at about.comanche at gmail.com, about.comanche at gmail.com. And I'm sure Fawn, you wouldn't mind having that information if anybody asks you for, you know, doesn't write it now and, and she will have it. And now any questions, I would love to, to talk to you all. <laughs>